All right, well, hello, you wonderful people. Welcome back to The Unseen. Uh, we are still in the Daniel series, and this week we are talking about Daniel chapter 8. And I suppose the title I can give this is Why We Still Need Angels. Um, so let's talk about it, and I'll give you a quick recap. All right, so Daniel chapter 7 uh, was last week, and it was a whole thing. He had a dream and kind of hit on the dream thing, uh, but uh, we'd had an activation or a practice thing that I gave you where there was that part with the Ancient of Days giving the kingdom to the Son, so Jesus, but it was before he was Jesus. Talked about it. I'm not going to go into that again. Uh and so I encouraged you, if you wanted to practice a meditation on scripture, to actually meditate on that scene and to like feel and see and experience what that would be like and how momentous that was. And it was, that's that whole thing of what was happening at that part of Daniel chapter 7 was a pretty heavy and a good way thing that was going on and what Daniel was seeing. Uh, that was going to happen. So I'd encourage you to practice that. If you haven't, go back and listen to last week's video. Uh, or if you did practice that, maybe you maybe you tried it out a time or two or however many times, uh, let me know. Tell me if you, if you tried it, if you experienced anything, um, just anything at all. Let me know. So this week we are talking about Daniel chapter 8. Just a quick synopsis of the chapter. I'm not going to go into all the details, like if you've been following this Daniel series, I don't generally go into all of the details because it would take too long. Uh, but Daniel chapter 8, he starts off with having, he has a vision. Um, so I imagine it was a little different. He probably wasn't sleeping. He was awake at this point, but he has a whole vision, this whole experience. And uh, essentially my some summation of the vision is he's seeing uh, the succession of kingdoms. And at this point when he has this vision, he's still with Babylon, which is the first kingdom that he's with after Babylon conquers Israel. So he's still with Babylon. Uh, he has this vision and he sees the succession of kingdoms. So he sees uh, something that represents the Medes and the Persians, which is the next kingdom that takes over. And then after that, he sees Greece uh, and something that represents Alexander the Great. And so what's interesting is he has this whole vision, but then we actually can see historically, like real history shows that this happened because, um, you know, we know we know about it. So just an interesting little validation to what happens here in Daniel chapter 8. So Daniel's vision we know historically actually came to pass. And uh, he sees all this, that there's animals involved, that's what represents the kingdoms. And uh, the the way it all happens, there's like kind of this fight and this breakdown of kingdoms and stuff happens. Anyway, he doesn't even know what it means. So he has this whole vision, this whole experience, he has no clue what it means. Maybe he has some idea, but it says he, he didn't understand it. And then a voice shows up, and we'll talk more about this voice, because uh, it's actually pretty interesting, but uh, it says a voice of the one standing on the river something. I forget the name, but uh, a voice shows up and basically calls out and says, Gabriel, come teach him. So I'm paraphrasing here, but he basically just says, Gabriel, come teach Daniel what happened. Or what that vision meant. So, uh, Gabriel is probably a name you're familiar with, and I want to talk about that just briefly. It's kind of the main point of this. So, Gabriel is an angel. In some tradition, he's considered an archangel. Uh, scripturally speaking, there's nothing that says anything about him being an archangel, uh, but tradition and there are other writings that references Gabriel that's outside of the Bible itself. Um, so tradition, you, you might think of Gabriel as an archangel. Is he? Is he not? I don't know. Doesn't really matter, I guess. 
Um, so uh, Gabriel is a name that a lot of people are familiar with, and I just think this is kind of an interesting uh, Bible thing when you get into like teaching this stuff. Uh, Gabriel is one of the few angels named in the Bible. So uh, you might not realize it, or maybe you do, but it, the Bible itself has the word angel in it a lot, like a lot, a lot. Uh, I don't remember how many times or I'd say, but it's like many, many, many times, like a lot of times. Uh, Old and New Testament, you can find the word angel and, well, different languages that we interpret to be the same thing. But anyways, that's not important right now. Uh, but there are actually very few angels named. So I'm not going to go through the list of them. Two very famous ones would be Michael and Gabriel, and then Lucifer is referenced. Um, and there's, there's some other kind of sort of named ones, but, you know, depending on the teaching and where you would go with that, it may or may not be names, uh, direct names, but anyway, don't need to go down that road. But Gabriel is one of the few named, and it's interesting because he is found in the book of Daniel more than once, uh, but the only other place that he is named is in Luke chapter 1. So you might be familiar with this story. It's a popular Christmas kind of story. Uh, but Gabriel is the angel who is named as an angel who visits Zechariah in the temple, who is the father of John the Baptist. And so Gabriel shows up when uh, Zechariah is basically pleading for a, a baby uh, in the temple. And he's the one who gives him the message that they're going to have a son. And he kind of gives him, and that's where you have the thing where uh, he shuts his, uh, Zachariah's mouth so he doesn't speak until the time when the baby's born. And uh, then uh, it says six months later, if you read down in chapter one of Luke, uh, that Gabriel visits Mary and tells Mary about you know, God wanting basically to bring Jesus into the world through her. So that whole thing, that anyone who's familiar with the Christmas story and, you know, where Jesus came from, you know, born into the world, we know that story. So anyway, uh, Gabriel is named as an angel in Luke chapter 1. So in Daniel, he's actually not named as an angel. It says Gabriel, but it doesn't actually say angel. Uh, that's just a side note, but it's a proof that this Gabriel is an angel that we find in the book of Daniel. Uh, and you might ask, why couldn't it just be another Gabriel if you're a studious type person? Good question. Uh, so Gabriel, well, let me say it this way. All through scripture, you find more often than not, when people are confronted with a heavenly being, be that an angel or something else, uh, they have a reaction to it that is beyond the norm. It usually involves fear, uh, whether that's literal fear or like the reverential kind of fear. Uh, they fall down, they're on their face, they fall down as dead. Like these kind of responses to being in someone who clearly carries some kind of presence, like the glory of the Lord in, in intensity. So you see that all through scripture. And so in Daniel chapter 8, you see when Gabriel shows up in response to the voice that tells Gabriel to teach Daniel what the vision meant. Uh, when Gabriel shows up, you see in response that uh, Daniel falls down like he's on his face and that Gabriel actually has to pick him up and, you know, kind of wake him up from being stupefied or whatever, or just out in the glory. It does, it's not really clear on what that means, but, uh, and the same thing happened with Zechariah. I don't know if he fell down in Luke 1, but he had the, he had a similar response to uh, Gabriel showing up. And so we see the same kind of pattern when Gabriel shows up in Daniel, even though he's not named as an angel, there's a very, uh, like the same response that all people generally have with angels. Uh, but otherwise, they usually show up looking like men. Um, you find that over and over again. And if you might have questions on that. I would encourage you to ask them. Uh, but there are other places that heavenly beings show up, but they're not necessarily angels. Because uh, every heavenly being is not an angel. 
I'm not gonna go there right now. That is a deep rabbit hole that I love going down, but that's not for this video. <laughs> so anyway, Gabriel is an angel. Uh, he, he shows up, he, he starts teaching, he gives Daniel the interpretation of the vision. So he walks him through it. That's not important for this right now. Uh, but an angel has come to teach Daniel about the vision that he just had. So I'm going to go to the angel thing again, and we'll kind of wrap this up. But one thing I want to point out about visions, so whether you're experienced in this or not, uh, whether you have dreams or visions, now I do believe we can have things like that the enemy's speaking to us or we're picking up. So everything isn't automatically good. Uh, so I want to give that caveat. Uh, but I want to say this, that every dream or vision you have doesn't have to leave you feeling happy and good and at peace for it to be a God thing. Um, I don't, maybe you're like me, I know this was something that I really had to learn uh, and still have to mature in. But there'd be times where I'd have these experiences, and if it wasn't, um, or even God was like leading me, like he was showing me something. Uh, if it wasn't like a happy thing, or it didn't feel like a, like a woo, that was like glorious, like that was God, that was the Holy Spirit just speaking. Um, and I would generally write it off, or... If it was like even troubling, I would immediately go to like using my authority against the spirit of fear or something. And there's times that that's appropriate. But what I want to draw attention to is that uh, just because you're disturbed or bothered or troubled by something, you see this all through scripture. I just, I think a lot of uh, Christians, we, we forget this that all through scripture you see people having encounters with God or having dreams and visions and they're troubled and bothered and we assume it's not God because it's, you know, doesn't leave us feeling warm and fuzzy. <laughs> uh, but that's not the case. And so right here, and this happens more than once, but here at the end of Daniel chapter 8, uh, we see Daniel has the vision, he has the interpretation of it, and it said that he was sick for a while. Like he was so troubled he couldn't even attend to like his duties for the king. Um, he was so bothered. He was disturbed. And that happens more than once. You'll see it in the book of Daniel if you're reading it, which I'd encourage you to do. But uh, yeah, so it's it doesn't have to leave you feeling warm and happy and all that, but it can be a God thing, but it requires us seeking him and like what is the Holy Spirit showing us? What is he saying? And just to, to give a, a point on that, I'm not going to go too far on this. Uh, Second Timothy says like that he's not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. I would like to suggest that that is not like a spirit of fear, like you need to take authority of a demonic spirit. Though, of course, that can be a demonic spirit. But it's actually more about a mindset. The spirit you are of is more about what you have aligned yourself with. And so if you're in a spirit of fear, you are meditating on things that are fearful or creating worry or whatever that looks like for you um, and the situation versus power, love, and a sound mind um, are also not separate entities. Like we would treat spirit of fear like a demonic entity, uh, but it's actually just the Holy Spirit within us and us connecting with what he has given us. So anyway. If you want me to explain more on that, maybe you disagree with me or you want me to teach further than that, ask about it because I can, um, just not right now. So anyway, every vision and dream doesn't have to feel good for it to be a God thing. Um, so back to the angels thing, and this is this will be the last bit. Uh, something that I, in the last few years, have been confronted with and have really been hungry and like learning in this area is giving the importance back to angels and their role and just heavenly beings in general. Because not going to go down this road either, but angels is a, or angel, the word angel is actually a job description. It is not a uh, title of a being, if that makes sense. Like, I am a human. If you're watching this, 
you're a human, at least probably. <laughs> um, you are. That was a joke. So, like, we are humans. Angel is not e equal to that. Angel is just a job description. And actually, in the Bible, there are humans that have the title angel because it means messenger. So, anyway. Uh, but, well, so go back to the point is that I think we, we've we forgotten uh, and maybe lost the value of what God created with angels and and their role and that like we actually need them and i think it's a disservice to to us especially us that we don't know how to like partner with that if that makes sense this will probably need a lot more teaching than i'm going to give right now but basically we need angels like though we have the holy spirit and and yes like he teaches us all things um, you even see in Daniel 8 that, uh, let's just say the Lord sent an angel to teach Daniel what it meant. Now you might say, well, Daniel was not filled with the Holy Spirit like we are, and you're right. But uh, you see in, uh, I think it's Matthew chapter 4, uh, Jesus had just gone, he had just been baptized and he was filled with the Holy Spirit. So at this point we see Jesus himself is filled with the Holy Spirit. And he goes to the wilderness to be tempted. And, you know, we know that whole thing. He's tempted by the devil three times. He rebukes him. And then after that third time, uh, Satan leaves him. And then immediately it says, as soon as he left, that angels came to minister to Jesus. So in that moment, you know, you could bring out whatever reason that's for, but someone who is a, a Holy Spirit filled son of God, and this was literally the son of God, but everything he did showed us how we are to live, that he actually needed angels to come minister to him in that time. So the whole point of that is just to say, Holy Spirit or not, though yes, we have the Holy Spirit, angels are still necessary. And it's not just about like this idea, like so messenger, we have this idea of like they're carrying messages up and down. That can be a thing, and it is, but it's more than that. They're, they actually have roles to play, and we experience them all the time. We're just, most of us are not learned in recognizing what that is or what's happening. Uh, but we still need angels. Just like Daniel in chapter 8 got taught what something meant, we can be taught by angels. Though, of course, if it violates uh, the Word, it violates the Holy Spirit, of course, there can be angels that aren't God-serving angels. That's a thing, too. Um but uh, angels are still very relevant. They have a, a lot to do. There's a lot going on with them in partnership with what God has given us to do. And so all of that is to say, uh, the whole point of this video is that we still need angels and we can actually learn to uh, partner with, with them. And so essentially with heaven and what God has sent them to do, just like he's assigned us to do things. So that's it for Daniel chapter eight. Thank you for joining me. I will see you next week and probably talking about Daniel chapter 9, but uh, or maybe I'll go further into some of this stuff. So if you have questions, let me know. And otherwise, I will see you next week. Bye.